Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. Wanted to start off the morning by going over some of my thoughts about a movie that I watched last night for the second time called Social Dilemma. I'm sure many of you have seen it on Netflix. And I wanted to go over my thoughts or try to articulate them to the best of my ability while going over this article from CNBC that kind of gives a summary of the movie for those of you who might not have already seen it. And I think one of the conclusions that I came to and that other people in the movie came to, it's just, it's not just George Gammon with his tinfoil hat, is that this could increase the probability of the United States having a civil war or maybe uh, a kinetic war with another country. And I think you'll see how I come to those conclusions. But then I also came to some conclusions that I think force me to, I don't know if reevaluate is the, is the right word, but to think more deeply about my own views regarding free market capitalism. And I think one of the main takeaways of the movie is that we should always be trying to poke holes in our own belief system to make sure that we are not living in an echo chamber and to make sure that we are not falling victim to, we'll call it fake news, or that we are not falling victim to some sort of bias, uh, that we are always trying to think critically and be objective, understanding that our views are by no means perfect. They may be the best of the worst, but they're never, ever, ever going to be perfect. Why? Because we are imperfect human beings living in an imperfect world. And I can sit here and talk about the benefits of free market capitalism all day long. And I believe wholeheartedly that it is the best system that we possibly could hope to uh, incorporate into our society. I think this system benefits the poor, the middle class, it benefits the rich, it benefits everyone, but it's not to say that it is perfect. We have to acknowledge that and we have to think through the imperfections to do a proper cost-benefit analysis on the appropriate role of government, assuming that there is an appropriate role for government. So hopefully I can articulate my thoughts clearly by going through this article. So let's dive in. Popular, so this is back in when it came out, September uh, 2020. Popular Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma, slams social media but offers few solutions. Uh, okay, I mean, I think they're trying to come at this from an angle of uh, business and these social media companies are great because making the S&P 500 or the, the, the stock market go up. So I, I don't know that it was really, I mean, I, I've got some criticisms of the social dilemma, but the fact that it didn't offer many solutions, that is not one of my criticisms. So key point, The Social Dilemma, a new network documentary drama on how technology companies have manipulated human psychology with dire consequences for our society is unlike, unlikely to impact these businesses' bottom lines. Okay. Um, well, I guess it's CNBC. That, that's a fair position, I think. So 
A frequent entry on Netflix top 10 list is the most popular movie since September 9 premiere on the platform. The social dilemma has been praised for being possibly the single most lucid, succinct, and profoundly terrifying analysis of social media ever created by IndieWare, as well as criticized for being manipulative and misleading. Um, I, I try to look at these things as objectively as possible. And I don't think it was really manipulative or, or misleading in my opinion. I, I think that the people who did the movie, they, they don't understand economics uh, to the extent that we do. I, I think that kind of goes without saying. And this leads them to some inaccurate conclusions, uh, especially when you're doing a cost benefit analysis. I, I don't think they understand history. They haven't gone into history at all at least economic history. But um, to be fair, that's not really what the movie was about. The Social Dilemma explores how the Internet's most popular products work. And we're talking about the Internet's most popular products. I don't know why they didn't name the company. Or here they did down a little further. But they should have named the companies here. We're talking about Facebook. <laughs> we're talking about Twitter. We're talking about Instagram. We're talking about uh, really social media. They mentioned email here and there but it was really around these social media platforms. So it explores how the internet's most popular products work on a basic business model for tracking users' behavior in order to sell targeted ads and induce addiction in various cycle, any various, any vicious cycle, excuse me. The film blends interviews with tech experts, including many former employees of Silicon Valley giants and PSA style dramatic scenarios illustrating the negative effect of social media on average Americans. So I'm not sure that that's really debatable. I mean, I, I think you, you've got to look at the business model, which they do well in this movie and say, listen, it, it's all about uh, engagement it, that these social media platforms, if they're, pursuing the profit motive, they're going to try to keep people on the platform as long as possible. That's just, I think that's pretty commonsensical. So if, if you were one of these, I mean, if you were working there, I mean, how would you do that? Well, I, I, what I would do is I'd first study human psychology and I'd say, okay, how does the human brain operate? What, what drives us? What, what motivates us? What, what actually keeps our attention. And I think what's unique about social media, which they kind of point out in the movie, is that it, it's kind of the first technology where, you, where it's very interactive. Uh, I remember growing up, I mean, we had video games, which uh, I, I think you could argue were, were kind of interactive to a certain degree, but, but not really on a, on a social level. And a lot of the arguments that I saw here for... Um, you know, how, why social media is negative. I mean, they had the exact same arguments for television when it first came out. In fact, I remember hearing these arguments about television when I was a kid. Um, Josh probably didn't remember that, but I sure do back in the early seventies. And I'm assuming it was the same argument for radio now. And they address that to a certain degree in the movie, but I, I would give them the benefit of the doubt or those who argue that social media is sub significantly different. I would give them the benefit of the doubt because again, it is a technology that is extremely interactive where television was not, you know, you couldn't hit the like button on TV or you couldn't post something uh, of yours, a, a picture of yourself as an example where people were giving you either positive or feed uh, or negative feedback that would, interact with the way your brain operates from a standpoint of dopamine. And if you guys were at Rebel Capitalist Pro, or excuse me, Rebel Capitalist Live, you heard my good friend, Mike Dillard, who's one of the, the greatest internet marketers of all time, uh, go up and talk about how you really need to be cognizant of dopamine as an entrepreneur and as an investor. And he's not talking about to try to get sales. He's talking about in, in your own mind uh, because this uh, really addiction to dopamine could drive you 
to make very poor investment decisions in the future if you are not cognizant or aware of the fact that this is actually going on in your own mind. And um, so going back to this, I, I, I will grant them their position for sure that, that social media is significantly different uh, than TV, although we had those same arguments when I was growing up around uh, around television. So they go on to say, among the many issues the film touches includes uh, include how tech companies have influenced elections, ethnic violence, and rates of depression and suicide. So they also had Jonathan Haidt on the documentary. Not really a tech guy, a psychologist. He's kind of in that world with uh, Jordan Peterson and, uh, and, and Rogan and, and, and Weinstein and whatnot. And uh, he's someone that I have a, a massive amount of respect for. And he went over hard data, especially with young uh, girls, uh, young teenage gals with their, um, you know, how often not only they're committing suicide, but how often they're, uh, they're physically harming themselves and whatnot. And the, the, the rate of increase is staggering uh, since the, since we since uh, Instagram as an example came along and and Facebook so there, there's we have to be careful because correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation and in the movie they imply that there's a causal dynamic there and there may be but there it, it may just be a correlation that that could have some other catalyst uh, that, that we just don't know about there there needs to be a um, was it a multivariant study, I, I believe, or multivariable study, so, something like that. I forgot the technical name for it. But you, you've got to try to include as many factors as possible. I know they make this mistake all the time when they associate college with uh, earning potential as if there's a causal effect there. And personally, I don't think there's a causal effect. I think it's, it's more of a correlation. And the cause of, of someone being successful uh, economically as a result of college was probably because they had parents that were encouraging them to get good grades. And then they had a, a social structure around them growing up that was very positive, very healthy. And this is why they went to college. Um, and this is also probably why they were economic, economically successful in life or one of the main reasons. Uh, but that didn't have anything to do with college. It had to do with uh, the a larger percentage of those types of people actually attending college. Now, now let's keep going down here. The employee interviews are most interesting as they explain how these companies develop technology that so effectively manipulates the human psyche and expresses their regrets for what they had unleashed. Remember one thing that comes to my mind is the individual who actually invented the like button for Facebook. He was saying, Basically, when they when he created or helped create that, there was like, oh, this would be cool. This kind of lets people know that they just like your picture. <laughs> and they didn't realize that now it it could potentially uh, create you know, suicidal thoughts in twelve year old girls across the United States because they're posting pictures and they're not getting as many likes as maybe one of the popular kids or something. Uh, that never was in their conscious thought. This makes a lot of sense to me uh, because we can sit there and point the finger at social media. And uh, I have done that myself, I think rightfully so. But to think that what the, the, the monster that is social media now, the good and the bad, and we've got to admit, there's, there's, it's not just all bad. I think there's great things that social media does. Obviously, I'm using the platform to reach you guys on, on YouTube, and we just had an incredible Rebel Capitalist live event. That would not have been possible without YouTube or without podcasting, or if you want to call that social media. So we've got to understand that, that this is not, uh, there are no solutions like Thomas Sowell says. There are only trade-offs. So there's going to be some good and there's going to be some bad. Uh, we have to acknowledge both. I think that's extremely important. But to think that these platforms in, in their current iteration were completely a result of premeditated thought and design, I think is 
inaccurate. Uh, I, I don't think that's being realistic. I don't think you are... I, I think you're giving a little bit too much credit to human beings in their ability to plan this far ahead. I don't think anyone, I don't think the people at the World Economic Forum, I don't think the IMF, I don't think the, the Zuckerberg, I don't think any of them are smart enough to see 10 years down the road and 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 say, okay, this is my objective. I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and everything's going to just happen perfectly to achieve this end result. And, no. Now, I agree they have a 10-year objective or 15 or whatever it is, but they, they don't get there in a straight line, and they don't get there without making a lot of mistakes. And I think it's very similar to my theory on how a lot of what we see in the world today is just a result of people in power not letting a, a good crisis go to waste. And so what I mean, let's look at the like button as an example. So initially it was created, let's assume, uh, in a very, for a very benign way, uh, in a way that was very positive and um, just very light, -hearted, I guess might be a good word to say. But then as it grew, I think the, the people that may have less than good intentions in the social media space, and maybe the central planners themselves, they look at that like button and they say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, it was created to do this, and it's kind of doing that, but look at all of these other psychological things that are occurring as a result of this like button being present. Never let a good crisis go to waste. So they're looking at that and saying, how can we leverage this to better achieve our objectives? So you see, right at the front, at the beginning, they weren't smart enough to know that like button. They didn't say, okay, we're going to try to manipulate all these people and create depression throughout the society. Therefore, we're going to create this like button. I don't think, I don't think that's smart. But I do think that 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 the like button was implemented uh, for very uh, good reasons or or the intentions were good when the like button was created, but then as it evolved and they started to see the data, then all the people who have nefarious intentions, they see that and like, oh, now we can leverage this like button that was created for something good, but now we can use it for something evil might be too strong of a word, but maybe it's not. So uh, this was the first employee interview that, that came to mind, and their warnings were dire. Uh, in the film, the former Facebook executive, Tim Kendall, says the biggest short-term worry is civil war. So you see, this isn't me just saying that. And if you understand how social media works, uh, this makes a lot of sense. And uh, I know it sounds hyperbolic, but when you actually just sit think about it. it it's tough not to come to this conclusion that that there's at least a, a significant probability of this coming to fruition so what i mean by that is when you watch the movie you see that what your news feed as an example or what you see in your suggestions or what you even see i know uh, periodically i'll like right here i've got uh I've got notifications on my phone, and I, I don't know why, but for some reason, these you'll see these are just, uh, I think, text messages. But sometimes I'll see a notification from Twitter or from, uh, usually it's just Twitter. And so uh, why? What, what, and, and why did Twitter send me that thing? Like, it doesn't send me all the notifications. It just sends me random. It's not random. Uh, and so it's sending me, so what it's doing is it's tracking every single thing that I do on the platform or even online potentially. And then it's taking that into uh, the artificial intelligence. And then it's, it's crunching all of this data to try to determine what state of mind I am in right now based on, you know, not just my, the, the history of what I've 
clicked on or, or what I've tweeted or what I've liked or what I've shared in the last two weeks, but probably going back to the beginning of me setting up my account. And then they're, they're trying, that artificial intelligence is trying to predict what mood you are in, what state of mind you are in right now. And then it's trying to say, okay, well, George is in this state of mind. What can, what little notification can we give him to get him to engage in the platform or with the platform? And that's what they're sending me. It's very intentional based on psychology. They're doing this for regardless of your views. So, if you're on the left or if you believe we should have medicine mandates as an example they are doing this to you they they are sending you uh real news they're sending you fake news they're sending you whatever they think will get you to engage with the platform regardless of whether it's true or not true it doesn't matter what their intention is to get you to engage with the platform and that makes sense because the more you engage with the platform, the more profit they make. And it's the exact same if you're someone that is opposed to the mandates. Let, let's say that you guys have to understand that, that even as, let's call it a, a, a rebel capitalist, being a part of this community, we like to think that we are immune to this type of nonsense or we are immune to this type of uh, manipulation. Don't kid yourself. We are not. I, I mean, one of the, the main principles of Sun Tzu, the art of war, is you've got to understand the enemy, but you also have to understand your strengths. You got to understand your weaknesses. And we are all human beings. So we are we have to understand that we are all susceptible to the psychological manipulation coming from these social media platforms. And regardless of, of what your views are on freedom, liberty, free market capitalism, it doesn't matter. We are all susceptible to this. So I, I think that is, is crucial. We'll get into things that you can do to kind of push back. But that's one of the things. That's why I always say you have to be objective. You cannot get in an echo chamber. You cannot fall victim to recency bias. You always have to try to poke holes in your own views. Listen to the other side. Do, do so objectively. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think is, is incredibly beneficial is periodically try to argue the other side. Like, like just try to have a pretend debate with yourself. Like I, I'm assuming most of you on this live stream right now are opposed to the medicine mandates. And if you're not, that's fine. Uh, I, I would like to try to convince you uh, that they're not good, but, but respect everyone's opinion. And I value diversity, actually, right? But, um, you know, what, regard, I think what I'm trying to say here is, regardless of what your views are regarding the uh, medicine mandates, you have to understand that social media is feeding you what they think you need to hear, right or wrong, to keep you engaged on this platform. And, and we all have to understand that they're doing that, and we have to be able to look at things objectively as possible, understanding our weaknesses as human beings and how we are susceptible to that. And I think being able to debate the other side just as well, if not better, then you can argue your own position kind of hedges your downside to use an, an investing term. We want to put it in finance terms, right? And, and your, head, your downside meaning that I think the better you can argue the, the other side, the stronger and more clear your thinking, your critical thinking will be and the less susceptible you will be to the manipulation from these social media platforms. Let's keep going. So Jaron 
Lanier warns, <clears throat> if we go down the status quo for, let's say, another 20 years, we probably destroy our civilization through willful, willful ignorance. So here is where I'm on the fence because, you know, a lot of their quote unquote solutions were, well, let's just get the, the government involved. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I don't know about that because now we're really playing with fire. And I know, I know this is actually kind of a unpopular opinion I have amongst people who really value freedom and liberty is a, a lot of people want the government to come in and regulate Facebook. Uh, I, I know even my good buddy, Robert Barnes has mentioned that, you know, the lawyer uh, that I work with, with the, our FOIA request slash lawsuit with the fed. And obviously I've got a tremendous amount of respect for, for Robert. He knows the law far better than I ever will, but he has argued why uh, this is really the court of public opinion type thing. Or this is really the, the the public square, I think, is how he references it using uh, legal history. Um, but I don't know. I'm on the fence because I, I really hesitate uh, to get the government involved. I think we need to understand that that most likely will make things worse, not better. And I think, especially as people who value free market capitalism, we need to be very, very, very apprehensive to say the least and our first our our default position should not be oh well let's just get the government to fix it let's just get the government to come in and and micromanage facebook i have more faith in the free market system now i think there's a strong argument that the social media platforms have received monopoly power as a result of government. That's a completely different argument, completely different. But I, I would argue that the solution, I don't think is to, the solution for big government isn't bigger government. I think the solution for big government, if the social media platforms gain monopoly power through leveraging their, their ties with uh, politicians it is to, create a system that makes it easier for entrepreneurs to compete. And uh, I, I know everyone always says, oh, well, that's impossible. You can't compete with Google. You can't compete with Facebook. George, you're just being naive. You really don't understand, blah, 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 blah. Now, I, I trust me. I, I get it. I, I get it. Uh, I understand how powerful these things are. Um, but I also heard that argument even when I was growing up, uh, about uh, the airlines, as an example, you know, TWA. Uh, they, they, in fact, they had this Donahue, Phil Donahue, had this exact same debate or conversation with Milton Friedman when Milton Friedman, one of the times he was on his show back in the probably late 70s. I remember watching it on YouTube. Um, it, it's, it's the same debate over and over and over again with Monopoly. And um, I, I don't, you know, they always say that to catch, uh, what's the saying, Josh? To catch a thief, you have to send another thief, right? So I, I think to take down an entrepreneur or to take down a business, i.e. Google, Facebook, Instagram, you have to send another entrepreneur. You have to send another business person. And that's the only way that you're going to effectively be able to keep the lid on social media dominance or monopoly without having these unintended consequences where the cure is worse than the disease. I mean, we should especially be cognizant of that when in light of what we've dealt with with the cerveza sickness in 2020 and in 2021. So I, I'm really on the fence. And, and then, but then I want to push back because I always do take my default is free market capitalism. But then I always like to say, okay, George, let's think of a scenario that would really challenge my own beliefs. 
And I want to share this with you because I think it will help you guys think maybe more clearly in the future. And, uh, you know, we can come to some conclusions together as a, as a group, as a community of, of rebel capitalists. I think to myself, what if there was a business that could just, that, that created some sort of technology that was able to literally brainwash you and society instantly where society had no control whatsoever. See, right now, I understand that that social media has close to that control if you use the platform. But I'm a strong believer that the best solution and the best way that we can take power over social media is just take your phone. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. It's really not that hard. And for some people, they say, well, my business is this, and it's all revolving around social media and blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah, I get it. But listen, I didn't have a cell phone until I was 30 years old. Somehow I was able to make a little bit of money before then. Right? Uh, somehow kids, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of my friends um, here in Phoenix. They have a daughter that's uh, right around seven or eight years old, something like that. And I talked to them uh, about getting the kid a cell phone. And they said, absolutely not. I said, well, well when are you going to get a cell phone for them? When they're 18. I said, okay. <laughs> well, good, good. I, I see the value in that. And I think most parents would say, oh, well, that's, that's um, maybe even dangerous. Because what if they need help? What if they need this? What if they get caught with a stranger or something and they need to make a phone call. I mean, my rebuttal to that is again, I, I didn't have a cell phone until I was 30 years old. And when I was eight years old, he didn't have a pager. He didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> Somehow we all survived. Right. So I, I don't know that it's absolutely mandatory for every single kid under the age of about 15 years old to have a, a cell phone. And I definitely don't think it's mandatory for adults like the people on this live stream right now to say that they have no other choice, that they have been so manipulated by social media that they just cannot set down their phone. Listen, I'm a guy that does two YouTube channels, that does more content than probably anyone you know. I have a, a podcast. I have a Twitter uh thing with with I don't know 100,000 uh followers or whatever. I have Instagram. I I am trying to do everything I can in my life to promote the ideas of free market capitalism, freedom and liberty through social media. But I I'm not on my phone all the time. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, especially not fa I don't I haven't been on Facebook in years. Uh, you guys say, well, George, I see posts from you. That's Gene. <laughs> that's other people. Uh, that's not coming from me. Uh, I do my own Twitter account, uh, but I'm on that maybe, you know, a half hour a day or something like that. And I wouldn't be on it near that much if I didn't have uh, all the YouTube stuff going on. So that's the easiest solution to me. It's just you throw down the phone, forget it for a while. And we should all have the the ability or the, the willpower, I should say, to make that happen. But what if that was impossible? That's my point. What if there was a technology that was so powerful that, that, that they, and I don't know what this would be, but they could just you know wave a magic wand and boom, every single person in the entire country or, or society was under a hypnotic spell. Would that justify government intervention? I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer at all. But it's definitely something that I'll, I'll, I'll be thinking about over the next couple weeks. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is, because, is to try to encourage all of you to think through your own belief system the same way 
because this is how we win, right? This is how we're able to think critically. This is how we're able to ensure we are being objective. And this is how we're able to take a position that is principled. Regardless of whether it's involving social media or the cerveza sickness or whatever we face in the future, principles matter. Listen, I, as a lot of you heard yesterday, I, I just got back from Rebel Capitalist Live, and the person we had close out was Dr. Ron Paul. When I was introducing him, to the stage. He hadn't even got there yet. He, he was he was walking up from the side of the room. And you, you've got to imagine this as, as if you were there to really understand the, the magnitude and the gravity of the situation. All 700 people, and this is when I was introducing him, he wasn't even on stage yet. All 700 people in that room were not just giving him a standing ovation. They were standing up and cheering for him. And I mean cheering for him loudly. Like we were at a, a soccer game or a football game where, where your team had just won. Or the home team had just won. And I mean, the, the, the hair on your arms, you're getting goosebumps. The hair on the back of your neck was standing up. I mean, your heart was racing. I mean, it was it was almost bringing a tear to your eye to see this gentleman that's, what, 87 years old or so that was walking up to the stage and everyone standing up and cheering for him, chanting his name over and over and over again before he even said a word. <laughs> Why? Why do people have that much of an emotional response when it comes to Dr. Ron Paul because he was principled. That's why he was principled. And I think that's something that we should all strive for in our own lives, regardless of what difficult topic we are trying to dissect. So here they go into some, uh, recommendations, which they kind of downplay here on CNBC, but I think they're very, uh, they're very good. They say, despite the confessionals and dooms saying, however, the final recommendations to the average consumer of these tech products are disappointingly unoriginal. Okay. But that doesn't mean they're bad. Uh, these self-help suggestions include turn off notifications. Yes. Uninstall time wasting apps. Yes, let's do that. Fact check before you share your sources. And this is they're kind of saying that in a nonchalant way, but I think this goes back to what we were just saying, what I've been saying over the last five or 10 minutes about being uh, objective, making sure that you understand that you are susceptible uh, to this, regardless of your positions, and trying to debate the other side as much as possible. And to debate it, have a be able to argue someone else's position better than you can argue your own position. And by doing these, a lot of these things and, and more, I think that's how you make sure that you're not falling victim to the, the psychological manipulation here from social media. And at the end of the day, just put down the damn phone for heaven's sakes. Jeez, oh, geez, oh. All right, so that those are, are my thoughts regarding the social dilemma. And I, I'm sure I'll have more uh, in the future, but I, I think for those of you who haven't watched the movie, you should. And I don't think it's, uh, their conclusions are completely, I don't agree with all of them because then they go into wanting government to come and talk about that. Uh, but then they also don't really understand uh, the economic impact. I mean, they never went over the cost benefit analysis of having these companies make less money. So I, I'm not saying that they should have free reign to make as much profit as they possibly can and screw over society. It's not what I'm saying. But again, as, as critical thinkers, 
we always have to remember what Thomas Sowell has taught us so well. And that's, we, we have to look at things as a cost benefit analysis. We have to look at the trade-offs because there are no solutions. Meaning that if you come in and say, oh, well, let's just regulate Google. Let's just make it break up or Facebook or whatever. That's not a solution. You may think it is, but it's not a pure solution. That's what Dr. Soul is saying. That may be a, 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 a benefit, but what are the costs to do that? So as an example, if you reduce the size of Facebook, that could be a huge benefit to society. Psychologically speaking, that could reduce uh, people's dependency. That could increase productivity. Uh, that could reduce the suicide rate with young females, as an example. But what's it going to do to people's pension funds? You see, throughout this whole movie, they're making it seem as though this is just profit, profit, profit from these greedy corporations and all of these billions and billions of dollars just going right to Mark Zuckerberg's back pocket. And then if we just reduce the amount of profits they have, well, it's only going to affect just a couple billionaires, and that's not a big deal. Wrong. That's a fundamental lack of understanding of how financial markets and publicly traded companies actually work in the real world. So you guys know very well that if you reduce their profits, okay, now you're affecting school teachers. Now you're affecting firefighters. Now you're affecting police officers. Why? Because they're in these huge pools of money, these pension funds that own Google stock. It, it, it's not just the Zuckerberg who benefits. It's all of their shareholders. And think about the... The, the, who makes up those shareholders. It's not just rich, greedy billionaires. A lot of times it's the poor and, uh, and, and, and the middle class uh, through their, their pension fund. Uh, and, and so if you bring down Google, okay, fine. That, that may be a benefit, but you have to look at the cost that you also potentially reduce the purchasing power of a lot of average Americans in the United States. So I'm not saying that I'm agreeing with one position or the other. Again, I'm just saying we have to do a cost-benefit analysis. There are only trade-offs. We have to acknowledge all of them if we are going to be principled like Dr. Ron Paul. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Make sure that you're always standing up for freedom, liberty, free market, capitalism. And we'll see you on the next